Good evening. Good evening. evening. I'm Seti Warren, Interim Director of the Institute of Politics at Harvard Kennedy School. Welcome to the John F. Kennedy Jr. Forum. Freedom of speech and civil discourse are bedrock principles to the Harvard Kennedy School, the university, and our democracy. With this in mind, we ask that our audience be respectful of one another so that we can have a meaningful discussion in the forum this evening. Now I'd like to introduce our moderators for this evening. Hannah Botterell is a junior at the college. She co-chairs our forum committee. The Honorable Matthew Mead was the governor of Wyoming from 2011 to 2019. In addition, Governor Mead served as United States Attorney for Wyoming from 2001 to 2007. He is currently a resident fellow here at the Institute of Politics. In many ways, our country is at a crossroad. Our nation's democracy continues to be challenged daily, weekly, and on an annual basis. No person has been more at the center of this conversation than Congresswoman Liz Cheney. Since September 2021, Congresswoman Cheney has served as the vice chair of the House Select Committee to investigate the January 6th attack on the United States Capitol. From 2019 to 2021, Congresswoman Cheney was the third highest ranking Republican in the House and the highest ranking Republican woman in the Congress. She also sits on the House Armed Services Committee. From 2019, In 2021, the Congresswoman served as the chair of the House Republican Conference. Prior to her election to Congress, she served as the State Department Deputy Assistant Secretary and Principal Deputy Assistant Secretary of State for the Middle East. Please welcome Hannah Botterell, Governor Matthew Mead, and Congresswoman Liz Cheney to the forum. Congresswoman, uh, welcome to Harvard. Thank you, Governor. We are very formal. I I know. (laughs) Liz. Exactly. (laughs) Uh, Congresswoman, uh, we're a long ways from the mountains and uh, prairies of Wyoming, uh, but I couldn't be happier to have you here. It's a privilege. Uh, And we've got some uh, questions for you, and then we're going to have the audience ask you some questions. But uh, first, I just want to tell you that uh, it, it is an honor to be here with you. And I want to thank you for your <clears throat> service to the United States and the thank state you. of Wyoming. Thank you very much, Governor. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, tonight, uh, we're, we've got you surrounded here. <laughs> Hannah and I have got you surrounded. And uh, I, I probably have the softball questions, but Hannah, That's oh man. So Uh-oh. <laughs> let me turn over to Hannah if you want to Great. give a welcome to the Congresswoman. Thank you, Governor Mead. It's such an honor to share the stage with both of you. Um, And I think I speak for the the masses when I say that we Harvard students deeply admire your political courage and are so appreciative of you taking time out of your busy schedule to come spend time with us here in the JFK Junior Forum. It's my honor. Thank you. It's an honor to have you. So, Congresswoman, um, um, it is a privilege to have you here. Um, We have, uh, in the the school here um, at the IOP, we've had some great discussions about the state of our democracy, the state of the Republican Party. And, you know, it's it's interesting that uh, this time in my life, uh, we're saying, how's our democracy doing? Um, But it starts with a number of things, but in particular, uh, January 6th. Um, January 6th um, was a terrible attack on our capital. And I've watched as, you know, it was highly condemned by Republicans and Democrats immediately following January 6th. Now, perhaps their words have changed, if not the change of heart on on some of the Republicans and and their views on that. But I'll give you two quotes. Um, 
Senator Mitch McConnell said it was a mob attack on the Capitol in his name, meaning President Trump. President Obama said history will rightly remember today's violence at the Capitol, incited by a sitting president who has continued to baselessly lie about the outcome of a lawful election as a moment of great dishonor and shame for our nation. As a result of the, the attack on the Capitol on January 6, uh, and originally there was going to be a 9-11 type commission, and it turns out there was a select committee. You have done a lot of work. We just had a, a hearing uh, last week. The question I have for you is to start out in this uh, topic is, you hear the criticisms about the select committee, including why is it a select committee and, and why are the people on it? Can you run through how it became a select committee versus a 911 commission? Sure, I, I'd be happy to. And, and let me also just say it's an honor to, to be here, um, an honor to be interviewed by Governor Mead and to be here with Carol Mead. And, um, to, to have the opportunity to talk about these issues, to thank you for your service as well and, and your commitment to the rule of law uh, and, and your service to our great state. So thank you for that. And, um, and thank you to everyone here, to Harvard, for having me. Um, you know, I, I think that uh, the, the question about how we ended up with the select committee is a really important one because people have sort of selective memory about this. But, if you look at the days just after the attack, um, you will find that there was near unanimity in the uh, understanding that we need to investigate. Uh, it was the worst attack on our capital since the War of 1812, um, and uh, certainly needs to be investigated. We began with the idea uh, that we would have an outside bipartisan commission, um, and this was modeled after the 9-11 commission. It would have had no sitting members of Congress on it, equal numbers of Democrats and Republicans, equal subpoena power, the staff would have been evenly divided. Um, so it was, it was very much envisioned as an outside entity that, um, that, that would model itself and its activities after the 9-11 Commission. Um, Kevin McCarthy, who's the Republican leader of the House, instructed John Katko, who was the Republican ranking member on the Homeland Security Committee, to go negotiate with the Democrats to get those things, to get bipartisanship on the committee, all those things I just mentioned. And CATCO did. And the Democrats said, OK, you got it. We'll do this. It has to be bipartisan. You can have everything you've asked for. Uh, at which point, Kevin McCarthy pulled his support for the idea. And um, Donald Trump clearly did not want an investigation. I think they thought if we don't have a bipartisan commission, we won't have any investigation, and, and um, that will be better politically for the Republicans. Um, it passed the House anyway, though. 35 Republicans voted for the Bipartisan Commission. Uh, it went over to the Senate, and in the Senate, um, Mitch McConnell defeated it. And again, I think it was a sense of putting politics first and thinking this is not going to be politically uh, a good thing for us to be focused on. And so, um, you know, he asked Republican senators to vote against the commission, and enough did that it died. So then we were left with the question of do we allow this to go uninvestigated? And um, in my view, there was simply no way you could do that. That um, this was an attack on Congress itself, it was an attack on the Constitution, it was an attack on the Capitol, obviously and it had to be investigated. So uh, we passed the resolution that created the select committee, uh, called for the appointment of uh, eight Democrats and five Republicans. Uh, again, the Republican leader proposed five individuals, two of whom the speaker said no, that the, those are not individuals for a number of reasons that, that should be involved in investigating this attack. Uh, I agreed with her decision. And when she said no to those two, then Leader McCarthy pulled the other three. So we ended up with a committee uh, that has nine members, seven Democrats and two Republicans. And, and I think an important thing to remember about it is when people say it's partisan, um, when they, they talk about the, the political makeup of the committee, you have to ask yourself, could it be the case in the United States that because the minority leader, the Republican leader of the House, um, decides that he doesn't want an investigation of this attack, that that can grind everything to a halt. 
And, and I certainly am of the view that that can't be the case. So that's how we ended up with the select committee. And I'm very proud of the work that we've done uh, and of um, my fellow members of that committee. Uh, I think it's probably the most important thing I've ever done professionally uh, and, and absolutely crucial for the, for the functioning of our democracy going forward. We've said. <laughs> I read a couple of op-eds about um, people looking from the outside in saying uh, sort of the question, what has it accomplished? Um, and I want to ask you that question, but certainly amongst the things that is accomplished is you have laid out, and, and it's, it's recorded, and people can go watch the videos, which I encourage them to do of, of each one of your hearings. But I think perhaps what some people miss is it, it also talks about the bravery of some of the witnesses who've come before you. Yeah. The, the police officers who were there that day, uh, the bravery and the threats that they face. But to those critics who say maybe it hasn't accomplished all that some have hoped, what, what do you think it has accomplished to date and it's not over? Yeah, I mean, I, I think your, your point, Matt, is a really important one. I think when people look back at this time in our history and when they look back at um, the time period after the, the election and leading up to January 6th, um, one of the most important lessons of this period of our history is that individuals made the difference. Um, and this was individual state officials, Republicans, who resisted Donald Trump's pressure to find him votes, to change the outcome of the election. Uh, it was individuals that he'd appointed in his Justice Department, the White House Counsel's Office, people who said, no, we're, we're not gonna allow, um, uh, allow you to steal the election. Um, it was uh, individuals who have come forward and testified to the committee with incredible bravery, um, facing huge, not just challenges, but threats. Um, and certainly uh, the individuals in the Capitol Police Force and the Metropolitan Police Force who fought for the Capitol that day, who defended all of us that day. And, and I think that one of the things that I hope that the, the committee has been able to do is make clear that you know, our institutions don't defend themselves, that, that January 6th could have been far worse um, if people in positions of authority hadn't stood up. Um, we also have a responsibility on the committee uh, to propose legislation to um, help to prevent any future attack. We've already proposed and passed a reform to the Electoral Count Act. Um, and, and, and I wanna be very clear, sometimes when we talk about reforms to the Electoral Count Act, um, the former president suggests that those reforms are only needed because what he did was not illegal. And I wanna make clear what he did under the previous, the, the current Electoral Count Act was unconstitutional, was illegal under the current Electoral Count Act. It will be illegal under our reform uh, Electoral Count Act as well, but we've taken steps to make it harder for anybody in the future to, to try to steal an election. Um, and then I, I just, I think one other point is, I think all of us when we began our work on the committee um, were surprised at the breadth and the depth and, and the scope of the effort to steal the election. And I hope that, that we have been able to lay out for the American people in a, in a very um, uh, clear and complete way each of the different elements of the effort that was underway to steal the election that, that Donald Trump was at the center of, um, and that we've, we've done that primarily through Republicans' testimony. That's another really important thing to remember. The people who've testified have been um, you know, almost exclusively, with a few exceptions, Republicans. Some working right in the White House. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Hannah? Yeah, so I think that for many Americans, the January 6th insurrection was certainly an inflection point in the future of our democracy, our country, and the Republican Party. And so I'd like to shift the conversation just a little bit more towards the future of Republicanism, Republicanism the future of bipartisan work, and how this affects young voters like those in the audience this evening. Um, so you recently said that if Donald Trump is the 2024 presidential nominee, you will no longer consider yourself a Republican. And that said, your voting record showed you standing in line with Trump's position approximately 93% of the time. 
so clearly you're a rather staunch conservative. So I'm curious, how do you reconcile this? Do you see the Republican Party as President Trump's son Eric suggested as now Trump's party? And if so, do you think that we might see the emergence of a third party for non-Trump supporting Republicans such as yourself? You know, it's a really important question, Hannah, because I think what it goes to is that this that this isn't about a, it's not about policy disagreements, and um, you know the the Republican Party, and I've been a Republican as long as as I've been voting. Um, Were your parents Republican? <laughs> <laughs> you may have heard of them, Matt. <laughs> um, uh, my grandparents weren't though. I That's did not interesting. Know that. That's right. We're gonna have no. to check into you. Maybe you are a rhino. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. It all comes out. Um, so, look, I think that um, the Republican Party. The reason that I'm a Republican uh, is because of what the party stands for, and and I happen to believe the most conservative of of conservative principles is fidelity to the Constitution. Um, and this is an issue that uh, you know we've talked a lot about within the Republican Party, um, in the House, uh, in the days after the election, um, as we were making decisions about people were discussing whether or not there would be objections to the electoral vote, um, the electoral votes, and, and I was making the case that Congress doesn't have the authority to object. Um, it's a purely ministerial. Uh, role that we play under the Constitution. And um, I do think that as a party, well, as a country, we have to have two parties uh, that can debate and discuss policy and substantive differences. There are big policy differences and big substantive differences. And the country is much better off if we're having those kinds of debates around substance. Um, I do worry very much about um, what's happening on the left. I worry um, that you know some of the economic policies that we're seeing um, are misguided uh, and dangerous. I worry about the spending that we're seeing. But no matter how concerned people are about bad policy on the left, the solution for conservatives cannot be that we're going to torch the Constitution. And we have to get back to recognizing we all have an obligation to defend the foundations of the republic. That's what provides the basis for the disagreements about policy. So I, I'm, I don't know what's going to happen. I, I, um, uh, I think it's very important for the survival of the country that, um, that Donald Trump not be anywhere close to power again. Um, and, and I think that's something we need to keep in the forefront as we go forward. Yeah, absolutely. So on a slightly more optimistic note, we have a lot of motivated, passionate students watching here tonight who are inspired by your political courage and your honesty and who want to repair the polarization that we currently see to help restore America's democracy. Um, at the same time, though, there's been a wave of political nihilism among a lot of young people, this feeling that there's no point in engaging in a system that feels so broken and so hopeless. And so I want to know, what's your advice? Um, how can we make people optimistic about a better tomorrow? And how can young people uh, help make meaningful change regardless of their political affiliation? You know, I, um, I think that that is, uh, as I said, just such an important message for people to take with them. And um, that is that, yes, we're at a moment of peril, certainly for our country. But the solution and the, the, the way out is by the action of individuals. And, and I hope that, um, you know, talking to young people all around the country, um, to be able to convey to people that the blessings that we have in this nation, first of all, are um, exceedingly rare in the course of history. And that means that each one of us has a responsibility and an obligation, and I know you know, sitting where some of you are in college or in graduate school and looking at what's happening in politics and what's happening in the government, it can all seem, you know, huge and impossible to influence. But the reality is you are the only ones who can influence it, the only ones. And that means you have to run for office. That means you have to get engaged. It means you have to do it at a local level. 
It means that you cannot sit back, and, and I say this at a moment when a lot of elected officials are sitting back saying, that's somebody else's problem. Hopefully this is gonna get resolved. I don't have to deal with it. None of us can be a bystander. And, and I think that, that it's, it's an obligation we have. It's also an unbelievable blessing. I mean, just think about the fact that, that we live in a country where you get to decide who your elected officials are. You get to decide, we all get to decide what laws we live under. Um, and that, it's an unbelievable blessing. And, and so I would just say, we need every one of you. We need you involved and engaged, and there's no more important thing that you, you could be doing than helping to make sure that we, we right this ship of our democracy. Thank you. On that note of democracy, okay. off to you. I just want to follow up with this, um, and you've, I, I know you're very familiar with Lincoln's speech um, 23 years before he became President Lincoln, um, but it's this question of what is the state of democracy, and, and you've touched on this some, but first let me start. Uh, there was a December 2021, it was the 42nd Harvard Youth Poll, and it said that more than half of young Americans feel democracy in the country is under threat, and over a third think they may see a second U.S. civil war within their lifetimes. And then the quote I want to read back to you, which I think you were looking at on January 6th. It was from President Lincoln and talking about how this country may fall and how that would happen. He said, if it ever reaches us, it must spring up amongst us. It cannot come from abroad. If destruction be our lot, we must ourselves be its author and finisher. As a nation of free men, we must live through all time or die by suicide. So I want to get your take, just what, you never thought you would see January 6th, nobody thought we would see January 6th. How fragile is our democracy? And as a follow-up, um, where do you find hope? Well, I, um, I think that it is fragile, certainly. And, um, you know, in, in the, the Lyceum address, um, one of the other things that Lincoln talks about is uh, how important reverence for the rule of law is. And I think that that is also something we all have an obligation to educate ourselves about. You know, the, the foundation of our republic is the rule of law. And that means that you can disagree with the rulings of the courts, but you cannot ignore the rulings of the courts. And um, when we find ourselves in a situation where you've got an assault on the rulings of the courts, an assault on the courts uh, themselves, a, a willingness to, to ignore the outcomes of uh, the decisions that are being made by the courts, um, we are in a very dangerous place. Um, it's also the case that, uh, you know, because we saw the courage of January Sixth and the courage of the days before that, you know, that does give me tremendous hope. If you think about, uh, you know, somebody like Rusty Bowers um, or Brad Raffensperger in Georgia, if you think about the people that resisted that pressure, um, that that gives me tremendous hope that there are people who understand their duty and their obligation. Um, and uh, you know, I think that we come to a place where. Uh, you realize that although these issues have to be above partisanship, elections really matter. They really matter. And so when you're thinking about who you're going to vote for, um, you shouldn't vote for people who tell you that they will ignore the rulings of the courts and they will ignore the facts and they'll ignore the law and they'll ignore the results of elections unless they agree with them. And we have many candidates today uh, Republicans, uh, and it pains me to say that because I, I've been a lifelong Republican, but candidates who say they will only certify elections that they agree with, that's the end of democracy. And I've worked in countries around the world that are not democratic. I've worked in countries where they have, um, where the people in those countries in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union and the Middle East, where people have been fighting for their freedom. and if you don't honor the outcome of elections, then you don't have a democratic system. 
So um, what gives me hope is the fact that, that we, the people, uh, ultimately get to decide this, but we have to care enough to decide it, and we have to care enough to do the right thing above politics and above partisanship. Liz, we're gonna go to uh, questions here pretty soon, but one more, Hannah, you yeah, got time for Absolutely. Me? Speaking of hope um, being inspired by courageous actions, I'd like to once again thank you for your courage and your integrity. And I really do think that for a lot of us, this, this, you do inspire hope in us for the future of our country and the future of our democracy. And so with that, I'd just like to say that um, President John F. Kennedy, the school's namesake, um, wrote Profiles in Courage um, in order to highlight leaders who took courageous actions in spite of enormous political pressure. And you actually were awarded a Profile in Courage award by the JFK Library earlier this year. Um, so for all the future leaders in the audience tonight, um, to what extent do you see the role of a representative as sticking to personal moral beliefs or conscience um, as opposed to representing the general consensus of one's constituency? Well. Um when, when you are sworn into office, um, you are, we, we all take an oath. And the oath that we all take is to the Constitution. Um, we all have an obligation and a responsibility to represent our constituents, absolutely. Um, but our oath is to the Constitution. And, and there's a reason why our oath is to the Constitution. Um, it's because at the end of the day, that is the fundamental document um, that guarantees the perpetuation of the Republic. Um, and, you know, when I see uh, my fellow party members um, abandoning the Constitution, suggesting that, well, it doesn't really matter that the former president sent a mob that was armed to the Capitol to stop the counting of electoral votes. He knew they were armed and he sent them. When they, suggesting that doesn't matter, um, you know, I, I, I think it's crucially important for people to remember the Constitution's our shield. And if we abandon it because it's politically inconvenient, then we are not going to have it as a shield when someone comes at us uh, and threatens our First Amendment rights or our Second Amendment rights or any of the other rights that are guaranteed by, by that document. And, and so um, I think it's crucially important. I also, I just, because you mentioned President Kennedy, I was telling this story earlier, and it's a really, it's one that means a lot in my family. My dad, uh, as Governor Meade knows, uh, flunked out of Yale twice, um, and uh, ended up, uh, after some soul searching and some words of encouragement from my mother, um, at, at the University of Wyoming. And he was there in September of 1963 when President Kennedy came and spoke in Laramie. Um, and when I was working with my dad on his memoirs several years ago, he told me for the first time a story of what it felt like for him to hear President Kennedy's words in that speech. And, and I went back after I was talking to my dad about this and I Googled the speech and you can hear the audio of it and you can hear President Kennedy um, talking about um, service to our country and, and talking about what it means for young people to choose service to the country. He also quotes Lincoln in this speech, and he says, Lincoln reminded us that a nation cannot remain both ignorant and free. Um, and I think that's it's another crucial, crucial lesson for us today as we think about what is truth um, and being in a post-truth society. But... Um, but the influence President Kennedy had on millions and millions of young people and their determination to serve um, is, is such an important um, legacy and something I know the Kennedy School really honors. So, All right, we're going to uh, go to audience questions now. Uh, for those of you who have not been here before, the rules are it actually has to be a, a question. It, <laughs> it has to be short. We would appreciate you giving us your name and affiliation with the school. Uh, I'm just having to glance over here. Professor, if you'll give us your name and your affiliation, please. Um, Professor Gloria Brown Marshall, also a fellow here. And as I said to the senator in the reception earlier, thank you for your service. Um, when the attack on January 6th happened, it didn't come from out of the blue. There had already been attacks on our voting rights and the need for the John Lewis voting advancement bill. 
So when we talk about supporting our courts and we talk about supporting our democracy, we have to look at the core of voting rights. What can you say to the Republicans out there about the John Lewis uh, voting rights uh, bill that will bring back to the Voting Rights Act and give confidence to the sense that voter suppression is not just another tool that the conservatives are using to undermine the votes of people of color? Yeah, it's a really important question. And I don't know if you know, but I voted against the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. Yeah, I thought you probably did. <laughs> Come clean. <laughs> um, and, uh, and I voted against it because it is a, a delicate balance for us um, in terms of the role of the federal government and the federalization of elections. And, um, and I think obviously, people of goodwill have different views about the extent to which, which that particular piece of legislation um, would have given too much power and authority to the federal government. Um, but I think that as we look at what we have to do going forward, um, there are really important steps we need to take to do things like protect poll workers. Um, if you look at the stories of people like um, uh, Shea Freeman, uh, uh, Ruby Moss, uh, Shea Moss and Ruby Freeman, um, you see that the uh, pressure and the attacks that, that they faced, and we've seen that increasingly around the country. We need people to volunteer to work at our polls. We need people to, um, to be recognized for doing that. Um, we, when we were putting together the Electoral Count Act reform bill, which passed through the House, there's a version that passed through the Senate, ours passed through the House. We're, we're going to be in the process of negotiating between those two. Um, but, but we looked at a number of issues like, for example, what happens if a governor or a secretary of state decides they're just not going to certify? They don't like the outcome, they're just gonna ignore it and they're not going to certify. And, and so we provide a cause of action on an expedited basis for presidential candidates um, in a situation like that so that, that we can anticipate what may be happening in the future. Um, I think understanding what's happening is very important. And I think making sure that we don't give people power who aren't committed to the sanctity of the electoral process is very important. Um, and I do think that there's, there's, although in some instances increasingly divisiveness on this issue because of January 6th, the fact that you've had both in the Senate bipartisan support for their Reform Act and in the House bipartisan, we passed ours through on a, on a bipartisan basis, um, I think gives you some hope for the future. Let's go over here, please. Hello, my name is James McCaffrey. I'm a first year at the college. I'm sorry, you need to get closer to the mic, please. Oh, is that better? Yes, thank there you. we go. Um, I was wondering, you obviously had a different upbringing than most of us being surrounded by a vice president. And I was wondering how, what you learned from him that helps you throughout your political career. Um, well, I, um, uh, you know, I watched both, both of my parents um, were, my dad was involved in politics and my mom in, in policy more um, and, and a historian. I think one of the things that has been most important is the, their love of history and their determination that, you know, my sister uh, uh, and I would both know American history and revere it and study it. It's been really important. Um, I think that Watching my dad operate, um, you know, at different periods of his career where he, you know, faced a lot of public criticism at times um, was a real lesson for me in having the courage of your convictions and um, knowing that, you know, fundamentally there, there are issues that really are above politics. And I think one of the things that has been the most um, surprising and also sad for me in the last year and a half uh, has been how few people actually operate that way. I thought a lot more people would, would be like that. Um, but, but I also just think a, a seriousness as well, and you can agree and disagree on policy, but a, a seriousness about 
the challenges and the threats um, and the issues that, that we're facing. So I see Congresswoman Harmon over here in the audience and um, know her years of service on the Intel Committee um, and, and her commitment in a nonpartisan way to the security of the nation from the Democratic side um, is, is another model and important example for us. Thank you. I think uh, up here, please, uh, your affiliation question. Yes, hello. Uh, my name is Kirthi. I'm a first year at the college. Congresswoman, thank you so much for joining us today. It's been an absolute honor. Uh, my question for you is more regarding the Supreme Court and what we're seeing today. Um, as we've seen an increase in polarization in the executive branch, a lot of people have also argued we've seen an increase in polarization with the appointments we see on the Supreme Court. There's been bipartisan discussion about perhaps adding new Supreme Court justices, um, but in this crucial body that's meant to really be defending the integrity of the Constitution and the increased polarization we see there, what do you suggest we can do to restore the justice we see there? Yeah, I, um, I think it's, it's really important, it's fundamentally important for the country that people have confidence in our courts and that they have confidence in our Supreme Court. Um, I don't believe that we should add members to the court. Um, again, I think you can agree or disagree with, with their rulings, but I think that, that we have to respect um, the role of the judiciary and the role of the court in our system. Look, I, I will say I, I, was, I went to the University of Chicago Law School and uh, I had a professor there who taught me civil procedure. And uh, she was my favorite professor because she did not allow politics into her classroom. And her name was Elena Kagan. Um, I know Harvard has a claim on Justice Kagan, but, <laughs> um, but, but you know, keeping the, the politics uh, out of the classroom was no small task. Um, and again, I think that the, the court is facing huge challenges and um, they're involved in decisions that are, are fundamental decisions um, uh, about a whole range of issues. Um, I think it's very important though that we recognize uh, that when you have people out in front of justices' homes protesting, that is wrong. It's not just illegal, but it's wrong. And, and we have to find a way to it's not just wrong, but it's illegal. But we have to find a way to ensure that as a nation we reject, we reject violence, we reject threats, we reject all of that in our body politics. And, um, and I, I do fear that we, we're in a place we haven't been in a very long time uh, in, in terms of, of the role that violence and, and upheaval has begun to play in our politics. Let's see, uh, yes, thank you. Please, uh, your affiliation and name. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Jonah Simon, and I'm a first year at the college. Uh, so my question was, at the beginning of this programming, Governor Mead read a series of statements by key members of the Republican Party, uh, Minority Leader McConnell, Minority Leader McCarthy, about uh, the attack at the Capitol, condemning it the night of January 6th. One of the most striking parts of the commission's findings has been the many different statements on the day of January 6th by key Republican leaders and members of the administration condemning the attacks. And yet, since then, many of them have about-faced and completely changed their policy. And a large part of this is largely because of demand within the Republican Party and seeing in their base that uh, not opposing January 6th uh, is leading to better electoral outcomes and will help in the midterms. How can we show Republican leaders and what's the path forward to showing that this is not the way forward by encouraging uh, future insurrections and encouraging future violence? Yeah, look, it, it, the, the way that we do that is by incentivizing the serious people. And, um, you know, right now what you, right now you have a situation where people, Republican elected leaders um, will say things like, well, I, I would like to do what you're doing, um, but I can't because, you know, the base um, believes X, Y, and Z. And, and, and this goes back to the point of, you know, elected officials have a responsibility to make sure that, that their constituents have the truth. They have a responsibility to help to guide the direction of events and not just sit and watch. Right now, um, you know, if you, if you look at the Republican conference in the House, the most extreme voices 
are becoming more and more powerful. And politicians on both sides who think that the key to you know, operating effectively is how many likes you get on you know, Facebook or on Twitter, um, they are incentivized. And, and so as a country, we have to say, whether you're gonna vote for the Republican or for the Democrat, vote for the person that you can trust. Vote for the person that you can count on to do the right thing. Vote for the person you know, that you would trust to babysit your kids. To, some very basic questions about, you know, your babysitters. <laughs> <laughs> we need to get Governor Meade to run again. That's the solution to this. But it is really, you know, if you think about how we decide about who we're going to hire, um, who you're going to entrust, you know, in other areas of your life, we need to be in a place where we understand that the authority and the responsibility people have in elective office requires those same kinds of considerations. But that also means we need to get more good candidates in the race. And that's my message also, is please run for office and, and treat it seriously. Thank you. A question over here, please. Uh, hi, I'm Jack Weiss, sophomore at the college. And I'm from Billings, Montana, so I was subjected to some of the ads against you on TV. <laughs> I can't imagine what it was like actually being you know, the target I, of those ads. I just ads, didn't watch but... them. Was... <laughs> <laughs> well, I did every time I, I would, had a morning coffee. So, <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> My question is, I would, I guess, I was wondering if you could go into some of the uh, the debate behind in in the committee about subpoenaing the former president, um, what you hope to elicit from his testimony, and the next steps once he actually has testified. Thank you. Well, it's a it's a really good question, um, and I hope that my ads weren't annoying because I'm sitting here thinking you're in my media market. They were too, great. So thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, look, I think from the the committee's work, um, you know, we laid out very consistently and, and I think thoroughly, including in our last hearing where we walked through President Trump's intent at each stage of, of this effort to overturn the election. Um, and, and I would, just as an aside on that, um, say that there are actions that he took like sending the mob and then refusing to, to send help, refusing to take action to stop it, that it doesn't matter what he thought about the election. We provided evidence that he knew that he had lost, that he admitted he had lost. Um, but, but for some of his actions, that, that intent piece doesn't matter in terms of his state of mind. Um, you know, I think we all felt it was, you know, there was no disagreement on the committee. We all felt that um, our obligation is to seek his testimony, um, that the American people uh, deserve to hear directly from him, that it has to be under oath, um, that, that he has to be held accountable. And um, so we'll be issuing the subpoena shortly, both for his testimony under oath as well as for documents, um, and we'll take whatever next steps we have to take um, you know, assuming that he will fulfill his legal obligation and, and honor the subpoena, but if that doesn't happen, then we'll, we'll take the steps we need to take after that. But I don't want to go too, too far down that path uh, at this point. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please, over here. Um, hi, my name is Alex, and I'm a junior at the college. Um, thank you, Congresswoman, for coming and speaking with us tonight. My question is about, it's a little bit more international. Traditionally, the United States has been a force for democracy in the world and promoting democracy in the world. But you know, especially now in light of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, how can the United States continue to credibly promote and support democracy around the world when it seems like it's falling apart here at home? Well, I think number one, we need to make sure that we're doing everything necessary to support the Ukrainian people in their battle against the Russian invasion. Um, and uh, I, I was, I don't know that I can say I was surprised, but um, uh, I, I think it's, it's really uh, disgraceful that today uh, Minority Leader uh, McCarthy suggested that if the Republicans get the majority back, um, that, that we will not continue to provide support for the Ukrainians. Um, you know, what uh, what, what's happening in Ukraine today shows is that democracy must be better armed than tyranny. And there, 
are a whole range of programs, many of them I've worked on for large parts of my career, to help countries that are emerging democracies, to help countries develop rule, the rule of law and establish a private sector and empower women. Um, and those are all really important. And American leadership is really important. Um, but you also have to make sure that democracy is better armed than tyranny. And today, um, Ukraine is the front line in the battle for freedom. Uh, and, and the world, not just America, but the world has an obligation to make sure that Ukraine prevails. And when you, um, when you look at the, the sort of post-World War II uh, world, and you think about the extent to which um, it has, you know, for the most part, um, been an era that has been characterized by the expansion of freedom, by economic uh, opportunity, by security, um, all of those things have not been accidental. They've come because America was leading. And if America decides, and, and there are people in the Democratic Party and people in the Republican Party who advocate that America should pull back, that we should, we should you know, return to an isolationist kind of foreign policy, that's a recipe for the Russias of the world, the Irans of the world, the North Koreas of the world, for them to fill the void. Um, and, and if you think, you know, China is another example. Uh, a, a world in which China is the predominant power will be a global surveillance state. And um, that is not, a, not, not a, a global order that any of us um, you know, want our children to have to suffer in. So I think America's role in the world really matters and, and American leadership really matters. Ms. Blaze. Hi. Uh, I'm Moshe, a lecturer in the college, and I uh, do research including on, on voter behavior and voter preferences. Um, uh, like everybody else here, I really appreciate the work that your committee did bringing the, the uh, threat to democracy, the ongoing threat to democracy, to the fore. And I really appreciate your own willingness to put uh, that issue above party and above uh, any particular policy issue. I'm wondering if you can speak to why uh, most voters, the media, or many voters, the media, and many of your colleagues haven't seen the, the issue for, for its significance and are still kind of treating this as a horse race or very focused on you know, particular policy issues that are in their minds or that are in the news. Yeah, I mean, I, um, I think, uh, well, I'm, I think that, that um, people face a number of challenges today. There's, there's you know, no question that it's difficult you know, for people to deal with groceries where the price is increasing, where the price of gas is increasing, the inflation that we're all living through is, is challenging. And I think that, that there are a whole range of issues that people factor in when they go to vote. Um, I, I think that what, what is really important for people is to recognize this issue we were talking about earlier, that when you're voting for someone, you know, you, you are entrusting them with tremendous power. And you're telling them, you know, we, we trust your judgment. And when, when people cast that vote, they ought to have choices of competent candidates. And we shouldn't be forcing people to choose between, you know, potentially far left economic policies that, that, they, that are damaging people's lives and livelihoods, or a party that supports insurrection. I mean, we, I think that's a symbol and a symptom of how far off the country has gotten. So, you know, I, I think we all owe voters uh, the truth and, and uh, an explanation about the threat we face. And, but fundamentally, you know, in 22, this vote really does come down in so many races to whether you're going to elect somebody who won't uh, respect the, the results of elections. And, that, that has got to be um, you know, something that is unacceptable no matter what party you belong to. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, please. Hello. Uh, hi. hi. Uh, my name is Benjamin Bolger with the Harvard Graduate School of Design. Um, Wyoming is a beautiful state, and your father was a congressman uh, representing the entire state, and you have the historical role of representing the entire state of Wyoming. What is it like 
Most Congress people represent a part of their state, <laughs> yet you're not a senator and you're responsible for representing the entire state. What is that experience like that seems to be very unique? And how has Wyoming changed from when, from when your father was a congressman to now? Well, some days are better than others. Um, <laughs> uh, look, it, it's, it is a, it's a very special place and um, Matt will appreciate this. I'm sure that I, I'm sure you probably use this statistic. So in a, in a Republican primary in Wyoming, you, you probably have around 100,000 voters and the state itself is 100,000 square miles. So you have one voter per square mile. Um, now, of course, not really. Um, people are gathered together, but, um, but it, it, it's a very special place. I thought um, carefully about running for the Senate uh, a couple of years ago, and, um, and I'm really glad I didn't do that. Um, and uh, you know, the, have the combination of being able to represent uh, all of the people in the best state in the country, um, and, uh, but also being able to be a part of the House of Representatives, which um, you know, is a place that I think uh, really does reflect the battles going on in our society uh, you know, in a way that sometimes the Senate doesn't, has been, has been um, it's just been a tremendous honor. Um, it has changed, there's no question. I mean, the, um, today, you know, the chairman of the Republican State Party in Wyoming is a member of the Oath Keepers. And um, it, it is a, it, it's a, it's, it's, you have happening in our state what we see happening in a number of places around the country, which is that um, people have gone in and have been elected to offices, to, you know, precinct level offices uh, and others, um, and have taken over party structures in a way that, that does present, I think, a real threat to, to democracy. But, but look, there's nothing like, and, and I say this having grown up going to the Capitol with my dad, um, having been around Washington and around politics, there's nothing like the first time you walk on the floor of the House with your voting card and you're, you're, you're the one casting the vote um, representing the people of Wyoming. It's a very special thing and an awesome responsibility and obligation. Thank, Thank you. you. Liz is here talking about our small population. There's some brilliant math students here. We're thinking there's two Wyoming people up here. What's the percentage of the population? <laughs> <laughs> Please, yes. Thank you for being here, Congresswoman. Uh, I'm, can you hear me okay? Yeah. All right. Uh, my name is Joshua Hansen. I'm a sophomore at the college studying philosophy, uh, and I'm a proud graduate of the Jacksonville Community School. So that makes wow, three. Wow, wonderful. Um, That's it's, great. I, know there's three I, of us I think here. this might be the <laughs> record Carol. amount of Wyoming people that have ever been at Harvard at one time. So I'm pretty excited <laughs> right. to be part of it. Um, so uh, I, in watching your uh, congressional primary for 2022. Uh, saw your campaign buck a trend that has been ingrained in me as a student studying government here, that the Democratic Party is one focused on policy, Republican Party is focused on ideals and values. Uh, I saw your campaign be very successful amongst Democrats and the Republicans that did vote for you still. Uh, They're all a, here too. Yeah, <laughs> um, on like a, a principled value-based approach uh, focused on the Constitution and uh, upholding truth and right, um, which was very impressive to see. You were able to flip my mom who's voted down ballot de Democrat since Dukakis uh, in the primary and uh, it was very successful. Um, for a Republican candidate in the 2024 presidential primary that is hoping to defeat Donald Trump if he is to run. Um, what do you think uh, that person, uh, I think some of us might hope that it's you, would have to appeal to uh, rhetorically with, with some sort of framework? Is it going to be policy? Is it going to be values? Some mix or, or something that uh, new that we can inject into the system? What, what would that approach be? Yeah, I mean, I, um I guess I, I think about it in, in, a, in a bigger way than, you know, uh, the election in 24. And I think about it from the perspective of uh, the, the terrain uh, on which we're standing is shifting. And, you know, when you have a Republican Party that has put, you know, fidelity to Donald Trump above everything else, um, that's very dangerous. And I think, 
There are, though, many more people who are in the Democratic Party and in the Republican Party who um, are reasonable and responsible, um, sane, who um, you know want what's best for the country. And and I I talk a lot about the members of Congress that I work with that I have the most respect for. And right now they tend to be Democrats and they are women. Um, a number of them are veterans. They serve on the Armed Services Committee with me, um, or a veteran of the CIA like uh, Abigail Spanberger, um, people like Alyssa Slotkin, Chrissy Houlihan, Elaine Luria. Women who, I, I may have big disagreements with them on some issues, but man, they, they are there for the right reason. They work hard, um, and I know they want what's best for the country, and I know that we can have a discussion and a disagreement and figure out where we agree, um, and 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 I know that those are the kinds of people that are are that you can trust with the future of this country. And I think for all of us, as we, you know, I know because the way our election cycles work, you know, it's just the, and the way the media covers it, it's you know what's happening this cycle, what's happening next cycle, and elections matter. But I think we do have to take a step back and think about. What kind of country do we want before we sort of go down this path of, all right, these are the Democratic primary candidates, these are the Republican primary candidates, what's the horse race? We have to think about whether we're going to perpetuate the union and, and the republic, and what does that take from all of us? Well, we're uh, about out of time. Uh, Hannah, you have one more short question, and then I'll have the last question, please. Absolutely. Um, so I just wanted to say thank you again all for joining us tonight. Um, for your thought-provoking questions to Governor Meade, thank you so much for being so gracious as to allow me to co-moderate with you. And of course, to Representative Cheney, um, thank you so much for being here and for your candid, honest discussion this evening. Um, so, as you may know, the JFK Junior Forum is notorious for being the premier space for public discourse here at Harvard. And so I have to ask, you and your colleagues on the January 6th committee hearing all seem to genuinely like, or at the very least, deeply respect one another. So why do you think that we don't see this level of civility from the rest of Congress? And what principles of civil discourse might lead those in Congress toward a culture of mutual respect and working together for the common good of our country? Um, I was going to make a joke about we don't really like each other, but we actually do like each other. <laughs> no, um, no, I mean, it, the, um, I think that the select committee, I would hope that it can really be a model for other committees in Congress. And again, you know, we have big debates, but there are several things that we don't do on that committee. We don't sit in the committee hearings and launch attacks at each other. Um, we also made a decision early on that we were going to not have every single member have five minutes, but that members would basically say, all right, you know, this person's responsible for this hearing and this one's responsible for this hearing. And, um, and, and I, think, I do think that it, it's, it surprised me, I think it surprised them, that we do like each other. Uh, and I think that you know, I, I tell people the story about the, the first time I met Jamie Raskin. Uh, we met on the floor of the House. We were elected the same year. And he's a constitutional law professor. And he was telling me he's written several, several books. And I said to him, well, why don't you send me one of your books? And he said, well, he said, you know, my last book was about how Dick Cheney and George Bush stole the election in 2000. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, OK, well, I don't really need that one, Jamie. You can send me another one. Um, but, but I think what we, what we do is we recognize that at the end of the day, we're all Americans, we're all working towards the same thing. And, and I think that, that I hope can be an example for other committees in Congress. I think it, it is how we should operate. Liz, I am going to get the last question here. Um, I know you've got a plane to catch and, um, but first a, a comment you spoke about, um, your father, how he was inspired by JFK, President Kennedy. And um, I, I will say, first to come, I think you inspire a lot of people here tonight and around the country. Okay. And that is maybe one of the most important things in my mind a politician can do is provide hope and examples of leadership. So I applaud you for Thank that. Thank you. The second thing is, you, there must have been some hard days 
I mean, at some point you knew the election was not looking great for you. I was totally surprised. Were no, you? <laughs> no. <laughs> and on the night of your concession speech, um, as I've told you, you didn't look like a person defeated to me, but a person that was determined. Determined to make sure that the rule of law was followed. Determined to make sure that we're doing the right things in this country to protect our democracy. And you spoke at your concession speech about getting a letter from a Gold Star uh, father and, and how that struck you. Would you share that? Because you, are, you and I have been to military events and I, you are a great supporter of our military. But if you'll share further what that quote was and, and what it meant to you. Well, I, um, there, there have been a lot of moments uh, since January 6th um, that, that, have been, that have been really moving um, and, and uh, humbling. And the message that, that you're talking about is one I got from a Gold Star father um, a few months after January 6th. And he uh, said to me, standing up for truth honors all who gave all. And um, it's, it's something I know um, I think about. I, I know my colleagues on both sides of the aisle think about um, the fact that what we are able to do, the debates that we have, the discussions we have about policy, we, we can only have them because people put on the uniform of the country and have served and have made the ultimate sacrifice in defending our freedom. And that's, you know, when you again are thinking about people in these offices, make sure that we're electing people who are going to conduct themselves in ways that are worthy of those men and women. And, um, and I, I just, I think, you know, in terms of, uh, of role models and service, uh, I don't know if the audience knows um, the speech that I gave that night, I gave on the ranch where Governor Meade grew up. And in addition to Governor Meade's service to our state and our country, um, his uh, grandfather, Cliff Hansen, um, was a tremendous mentor for generations uh, in Wyoming and uh, certainly for my dad. Um, and, and so I, it's really it's a special honor to be able to be here with you and, and have the chance to talk about these issues that matter so much. Well, it's, it's a, a great privilege to have you here. And I thought maybe once uh, while we're talking tonight, you could call me professor, but it, you know, <laughs> I don't think I can do you that. Can't? <laughs> Well, I, that's all right. I can't, Carol won't do it either. So, <laughs> so but it's a privilege and um, it's an extraordinary being here. And as you can see from this amazing audience and the great questions they ask, and great students like Hannah, it's a privilege to be here. And so uh, we applaud you for your work. Thank you for being here. And we give you a, a big Harvard thank you for being here with thank us tonight. You. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.